All right, Dave, they decide that they've grown big enough for their britches on WTBS that they can take Starcade out of Greensboro for the first time, and they go to Chicago in the UIC Pavilion. Was this a bad move? Yeah, it was. Um, you know, the show had a, much bigger problems than that, but I do believe that um, – it's not just Greensboro, it's Greensboro and Atlanta. Greensboro and Atlanta both had Thanksgiving traditions. It was Thanksgiving. It's one of those things in the culture. And Greensboro more, because Greensboro started in 61. And so this is 87. So they've had a, a Thanksgiving card since 1961. And it always was, you know, I mean, I don't say every year was the biggest crowd of the year, but most years it was the biggest crowd of the year. And they had established, it was something in that community where Thanksgiving night, you know, I mean, Greensboro was not a great giant population place at the time. But Thanksgiving night, you you go to the Coliseum, you see the big show of the year. It was their WrestleMania. So um, I think and, and Atlanta would do, you know, Atlanta started its own traditions. Atlanta would have the lighting of the Christmas tree at, you know, on, on Thanksgiving night at like 730. And you have hundreds of thousands of people or whatever, maybe maybe 100,000 people. I don't know. But it was this thing where everybody went downtown to see the lighting of the Christmas tree. And then, you know, at eight o'clock it's over and that's when wrestling started. So they were, they would do 10,000 to 15,000 people. Even when this, the city wasn't that strong, Thanksgiving night was always a big crowd. So, right. they, they, so that's why, that's why they did the two cities was because they didn't want to give up the Atlanta tradition. And when they were doing in 85 and 86, I mean like Greensboro would sell out because of the, the, the tradition. Atlanta was was 16,000 people, which I think the Omni held 16,500. So they actually, but, but you know, they would be high ticket prices for the time. Um, but I mean, the point is, is that you're getting two sellouts in, 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 in those buildings. So you don't want to move away. Then they take everything away. They don't do the two cities. They want to make it easy. And they want to prove that they're a national promotion. Mm. So they go to Chicago. They're not really strong enough in L.A. And Chicago, they were really strong because of the Road Warriors. Um, you know, they were selling out every thing every time they went to the uic pavilion at that time they were selling out it was nine thousand seats um and they were confident that they could sell out and as, as i recall they sold out two weeks in advance so so that was not a flop in the sense of of that but but i think it was a huge mistake because they ruined a tradition that that um you know i guess if they were going to go out of business in a couple of years it was going to end anyway yeah but but uh, well, in, was, in addition to disenfranchising those traditional hotbeds, did they also not kill Chicago by not having the Road Warriors go over Arn and Tully and doing the DQ finish? Yeah. Now, that one was a mistake. No. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you know, here's the thing. That's the same finish that they've been doing over – by this point, this is 87. They've been doing these finishes at house shows in Chicago with Flair and Dusty. They've been doing this finish at house shows in Greensboro every month. In mm -hmm. some match, you're doing that finish. So people were sick of that finish. I mean, this wasn't this wasn't 85. This was just and then, you know, again, the Road Warriors were the key big act in, in Chicago. They were like I said, they were doing sellout business. And I don't remember if they ever sold out Chicago again afterwards. I have to look it up. But I remember going after and, you know, it was instead of like nine thousand. When I remember going, it was like five thousand. And even even the Flair Steamboat match didn't didn't sell. Out. They had sixty eight hundred and maybe fifty two hundred paid. If, which, which is, which, you know, if you think about it, it's really pretty crappy for that. Um, and I remember seeing Flair and Funk before like 4,000 people in Chicago when, you know, with the Road Warriors. Um, wow. It, it was, it was, it, you know, sometimes you got to do it. And, and, and I, I did have that gut that they, that they weren't going to change it because I think that there was the feeling, well, we really don't want the titles on the Road Warriors, and Arn and Tully are such a great team, and it's better to have the Road Warriors chasing. But you know, you you know, you there's this point, you know, and it and it comes, and you know, we're doing the same thing with Roman Reigns right now. You never know when the peak is, but if you pass the peak, you've blown it, and then and you that, know it too. <laughs> but you don't know, you don't know it. I mean, if you've got great sense, you can sense it. I like to feel, you know, I like to feel that that I had the sense that night because I thought. You know, if no, but I'm saying you know when you've blown it. You know when it's too late. You know when it's. Well, yeah, I'll tell you what. When I, watched, when I watched the reaction to that match, um, I knew that that was like a, just a huge mistake. Yeah. Um, you know, because the, the, the it wasn't the right kind of like there was tremendous heat in Chicago when the Road Warriors got screwed out of the title, but it wasn't the right. It wasn't the heat when when Dusty did. 
This was the heat on the promotion, heat on the booking, heat on the decision making. Seen this too much. You fooled us too many times. Right. You know, and and you just, it, you know, you you brought us in for this big show, and the Road Warriors, you know, because the Road Warriors, even though they're from Minneapolis, Chicago took them as hometown guys because they were built from Chicago, even though they really weren't. So, so it was like our hometown guys. It was you know the same thing. Um, I, I'm sure that that when, with Vern. You know, there was that point where Bruiser and Crusher had to win, and and mm-hmm. I think Vern probably on those days Bruiser and Crusher won. This is tantamount <laughs> to putting Cena over CM Punk at Money in the Bank that Chicago night. Um, yeah, yeah, I think um, if they had done that, I think it would have been absolutely disastrous for the Chicago market and 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 for everything. And I, I actually, when I watched it, thought that that's what WWF was going to do anyway because <laughs> I didn't know that Punk had signed that morning. But, um, yeah, the, um, yeah, it, it was just a bad move. And, and, um, the road wars were never the same as draws. I mean, and, and they were huge and they were never, the, I, I don't think they were, they were never the same after, after that night. They, now, needed, they needed to win that night. Another sort of head scratcher, um, maybe just only in retrospect is Ric Flair's challenger on this evening, one Ronnie Garvin, the show closer for the championship. They had a red hot match. I think it was in Baltimore leading up to it where Garvin takes the title. So he comes in. Detroit was the one where he took the Detroit. Title. Pardon me. So he comes in defense against Flair. What was the thought process behind elevating Garvin all the way up to Ric Flair's foil for a starcade? The deal was that Dusty felt that they, you know, the, 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 the thing was, it was time for a baby face to win the title to set up Starcade because they really didn't have, like they couldn't go with Dusty again. Um, or, you know, I mean, Dusty, I think Dusty just felt he couldn't go with him. They'd gone with Nikita. I forget who the other the, uh, baby faces were. There were a bunch of baby faces there that were all very good. And Ronnie Garvin was good too. But um, Ronnie Garvin wasn't nearly all that over. Flair and Ronnie Garvin were having really good matches. Very solid, believable. But they weren't, um, it's like, Flair had had the guys that that he could draw with, you know, you know, like 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 Lex Luger. Although you know at that point Luger wasn't around, and, and Sting, Sting I believe was um, on that card, but he was still an opening match guy. I think. As yeah, I they just bought UWF, maybe, so yeah. Yeah, I, if he was even on that card, I, I don't even remember. Yeah, he was. Sting he was, was in the op- he was in the opener with Michael Hayes and Jimmy Garvin against Eddie Rick right, right, and six, Larry. Six, yeah, but he, he wasn't ready for a world title match yet. No, I mean, no. Law, you know. No, you know, he, he actually was. I mean, the big match was only a couple months later, but that was the match that made him. But he, but Sting wasn't a big thing then. Um, and um, I'm trying to remember what other baby faces there were. I think Bar- Barry, maybe. I don't remember. There were a bunch of baby faces. Whatever it was, Dusty didn't want Flair to beat them at Starcade. Whereas Ronnie Garvin, I think he felt that he could beat Ronnie Garvin at Starcade. Mm-hmm. And the the whole thing was just a disaster. People didn't ex- the that Ronnie Garvin won the title, and the TV ratings. I remember that they they the TV ratings just plummeted. Um, and it was the people just wouldn't accept Ronnie Garvin as world champion. I remember I, it wasn't so bad. I remember when I watched the match in Detroit, and um, you know it was a really good match. And and Ronnie had been chasing him. I didn't. I never considered Ronnie Garvin world championship material. But when he walked out on TBS, the new babyface on TBS, like a week later, and he's wearing Ric Flair's belt, and the reaction of the crowd, it was just like you're an imposter wearing Ric Flair's belt. And that's when you really saw. Like they just wouldn't accept him, and 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 business really went down, but with with you know that period, the you know Starcade did did well live, but but um, yeah, Ronnie wasn't strong enough, and and you know you if you watch the match, I mean Ric Flair was completely cheered against Ronnie Garvin, and Ronnie Garvin, I remember you know he came up, they did a match in San Francisco, and the people booed Ronnie Garvin here, and mm-hmm. they never booed him when he was challenger, you know, but when he was champion, it was like you were, you know. Babyface or not, you're a pretender, and we don't believe you're a world champion. It was very strong, and um, it was just it, in hindsight, yeah, it was terrible, a terrible decision. Starkey eighty seven would have been their first on what we think of as pay per view, correct? Barely, but yes, it was the first time. I, you know what would have been, um, and I thought they were going to do it too. The way that they were promoting it so strong was the first War Games. Was it July the fourth, eighty six? Sounds or, right. Or eighty seven. I'm trying to remember if it was eighty six or eighty seven. Um, but but whenever the first it was I remember it was July fourth though at the Omni, and I remember that they were this was the when Dusty was promoting even though it was a, a regional local show, 
they were promoting this match everywhere for whatever reason. I don't know. It was maybe it was marketing. Because um, because in those days, people were not going to – the mentality wasn't there that you go to Atlanta. I mean, maybe some people who lived three, four hours away, yeah, maybe they would drive. But it's not like – People from Charlotte are going to fly to Atlanta to see the war games. It didn't happen. They drew from the local market, but it drew, you know, it drew 16,000 people. It was a huge success. And and I thought, God, they're promoting this thing nationally so big. They're going to announce this thing is going to be a pay-per-view. It's going to be the first pay-per-view. And I thought it would do really well because he promoted it so well. Mm -hmm. And it was, you know, again, first time war games. The, the promotional videos were good. It was all the top guys. The whole surrender thing was, was, um, you know, just the whole, it was it was so strong that I, I, I if they had, if they had made that a pay per view it would have been and this is when, and they were still hot too if they made that a pay per view they would have jumped off on pay per view and they would have had a big success but they didn't do it um, and so the, the they went to the, um, um, the 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 Starcade and um, that was going to be their their coming out and I think it probably would have done okay. I think that the war games actually would have done better because the, you know this by this point in '87 they're they're on the downslide. They're past their peak. But you know Vince obviously sabotaged it completely and um, certainly did. Yeah. The first Survivor Series that year, and if you want more on that, do revisit our talk with Dave in the WrestleMania series. We're around WrestleMania three or four. We talk about the counter programming that begins. Um, but yeah, that, that took a huge hunk out of it. Now, was Jim Crockett kind of signing guys to contracts thinking, oh man, look how much business Vince did at WrestleMania 3. We can make millions here too. We can afford to make all kinds of encumbrances and all kinds of uh, contract contracts here. Yeah, so what they did was to keep guys from going to Vince. I mean, Crockett knew that Vince was paying guys big money, but he wasn't necessarily guaranteeing it. So his thing was, is what I'll do is I'll guarantee money. But to keep the cash flow thing working... Like, let's just say Lex Luger, um, his contract, which which was for like a half a million a year, which in those days was a gigantic contract for a yeah, guy who was unproven. And there was a lot of resentment from that. But, this, you know, like uh, the Midnight Express was probably 225 each, mm-hmm. just as an example. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm pretty close with that number, if not exact. Um, I'm trying to remember who else. You know, Flair was probably, you know, seven. Um, so he was guaranteed. But the thing is, he would pay guys each, you know, two weeks on the houses. So you would, and then the idea was, if balloon did, payment at the end of the year, there'd be a balloon payment at the end of the year, which he was going to get because the first year was going to be the Starcade, and and they were going to do like Vince was doing one pay per view a year, and their big thing that they were selling the guys on because before they, they did the Survivor Series, so they had one pay per view year was WrestleMania. So Crockett was his mentality was we're going to do four pay per views a year, so maybe we won't do as big as WrestleMania, but we're going to those four shows are going to, we're going to make millions on four shows. So, and he would sell, sell like the road warriors and midnight express and flair and all these guys that, that could have gone to Vince. And he was going like WrestleMania may come once a year and it's a big payoff, but we're going to have four of them. And I'm going to sign you to a guaranteed contract, which Vince wasn't signing people to, but you know, again, to keep the spending deficit. So the, it was that pay-per-view money that they were going to collect four times a year and that was going to be more than enough to make those balloon payments at the end of the year. More than enough. I mean, the way it was figured. And, um, you know, it didn't work out that way because Vince sabotaged that first star arcade. Nobody picked it up. Um, and come the end of the year, now all of a sudden, you know, when, when it came time for those balloon payments, he didn't have money. And, and they, that's when they started having to sell the company. Now, you know, this is also the years we've talked about and made clear that they buy uh the bill watts territory for a million so that takes a hunk out of their money as well yeah yeah it was it was, it was they bought it for four point something million but i think he paid about 1.2 or 1.3 of it. the the argument I've, I've heard is that you know crockett could have just let bill watts die on the vine he was struggling economically the the oil economy taking a big dive he was hurting but instead he was kind of coaxed into paying a million by almost being convinced, even if it was smoke and mirrors, that Vince was closing in on buying Watts. And so Crockett seizes the opportunity. Do you think that that ultimately hurt him bad to have all that cash go out to buy the UWF when he probably could have just picked the bones? In hindsight, yes. In hindsight, the two things that killed him were – what killed Bill, what killed Bill was, was one of the things that started killing Crockett is Bill, Bill was a smart guy. But Bill knew – I mean there are two problems that, that Bill had. Number one is um, the oil problem, 
you know, the, 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 the economy in Houston and New Orleans, which were his key markets, got terrible. I mean, he was just, you know, he was just drawing terribly in, in, in those cities, you know, not, not so much Houston. I wouldn't say terrible. Houston, I would say bad. New Orleans was terrible. And these were markets that he was doing great in before. And, you know, it was just people didn't have money. I remember when, um, you know, it, it just, you know, you know, they, they tried the three dollar ticket price um, at the Superdome. And, and I mean, and they did get a lot of people when they did that, you know, like 10,000 people. Which, but but you know you only did seventy thousand more growth for the Superdome, so it wasn't really that 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 successful. But but the key thing, so so Bill's having trouble in his market, and Bill also sees the way the game is going that that it's going to be every regional is going down. So you either go become a national or you go down. Bill knew that. So Bill's thing was is okay, we, I don't got TBS, and I don't got USA Network. And he got shot down for ESPN. So I got to get syndication. Well, Vince had changed the rules of syndication. I mean, Bill could cite all of his ratings and his ratings of his TV shows were phenomenal in his market. And it meant nothing because all these TV stations, because of Vince, knew that wrestling pays us. You know what I mean? We don't put it on for ratings because wrestling promoters will pay us. So Jim Ross went to the Natby convention and met with TV station owners everywhere and he cooked these deals for, you know, 1500 a week here, 2,500 a week here, 3000 a week here, you know, to buy TV and all the big markets. Unfortunately, they couldn't make that money back and they had this big, they had this mm-hmm. great syndicated network, but they were losing their ass. And, and one of the things they thought that they could do is well, we got this great syndicated network. We'll sell ads. Well, you know, that the, the you know, they didn't know that people, that national advertisers weren't going to buy wrestling. They just thought, look at our rating. Our ratings are going to be so big nationally that we're going to make money on national advertising. So that will pay, recoup this. Well, it didn't happen. They weren't getting national ads. So Bill, you know, Bill's losing money like crazy that he doesn't have. So Bill's got to get out. Like you said, he's got to get out. He's about to fold. Um, they, they go to Vince they threaten that they threaten Vince with this bluff that they're going to file an antitrust suit against Vince for, mm-hmm. for whatever reason. Um, or you could buy us. Vince doesn't bite. Uh, they go to Crockett. Vince wants us. You know, Vince is willing to buy, but we'll go to you. Right. Right. Crockett bites. Plus, the difference was is Crockett had TBS. Vince already had Vince already had syndication everywhere. Mm-hmm. Vince didn't need new, you know, the, the Bill Watts syndication. There's there nothing to buy for him. Crockett wanted Crockett. in the game, though. He saw like a, a world wrestling network of ad sale possibilities. Right. Well, the other thing is Crockett had TBS, but you've got to remember, you know, TBS in, in those days, maybe they're in, I don't know, was it 40 million homes? You know, yeah, was, yeah. whatever it is, 30, 40 million homes. It wasn't like 100 million homes. Um, I mean, they had national penetration, but but you couldn't you couldn't sell a live show off of TBS very well. In some markets you could. I mean, but but most markets you, you needed that local TV. If, if they came to San Francisco, just as an example. With no local TV and just off TBS, they wouldn't be able to draw. But when they got those local syndication, yes, they could draw uh, to a degree. But the people never accepted them as the, the local promotion. But the, the, so the whole thing is, so they Crockett bought UWF for the syndication, basically. The idea of buying syndication mm-hmm. and all those things. But then he had those syndicated bills. So he, had the, he, he took over Watts' bills and he had the same problem with Watts that they couldn't go to these markets and, and draw enough to, to pay the bills. And also they were living high and yeah, no, the whole Watts thing, I think the, the Watts thing and the, um, Starkey 87 yeah. were the, the key things to me that, uh, that doomed Jim. I mean, Jim probably was going to be doomed anyway, but, um, you know, I, I've got to think, um, just because, you know, you, I, 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 I don't know. It, it just, it just felt that he was, he was going to be doomed anyway. Maybe, maybe not. Maybe if they'd gotten on, you know, again, maybe if they'd gotten on TV and I mean, pay-per-view in 85, 86, when they were really strong and, 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 and would have had that money from pay-per-view from those years, they'd had enough money and they'd be on pay-per-view and, and maybe they'd be able to fight Vince that way. But by the time they got on pay-per-view, they were already fading. And I mean, real pay-per-view, I mean, because the first real pay-per-view they had would have been the bash in 88. They did the bunkhouse stampede that wasn't in a lot of markets and got killed. They did the Starcade that got killed in 87. So the big one was the bash, which did okay. But by then they were so deep in debt that, you know, it was too late. 
Yeah. yeah and we seen. see that evidence here. Stings on the card. Steve Williams defends the UWF heavyweight title against Barry Windham. Uh, Terry Taylor's on the bill. We see guys come in that were working for Watts at the time. Um, and it's, you know, Taylor drops to Nikita to unify the UWF and NWA TV titles. Um, there's not really much of a push, even though Steve Williams does go over Barry Windham for the UWF heavyweight champ being anything but a second match guy. Can you talk about the blown potential of the UWF guys coming in and how it kind of foretold how not to do invasion angles in pro wrestling? Yeah. Well, I mean, that's the funny thing is they were getting stale. And the purchase, I was excited about the purchase because it was like, is exactly what they needed because Watts had a lot of good talent that had never been exposed on a national basis. So, um, you know, it was fresh, good talent. They knew how to talk. They knew, you know, and and to mix them in. And, you know, you had the Freebirds and you had, uh, you know, I thought it was like, a, a, um, it, it, it was exactly what Crockett needed. The thing was, is Dusty, his mentality was, you know, he, they were so busy fighting, there was like this rivalry. I mean, it wasn't like they were at war. They worked together on the, the Crockett Cup. But it was like, there was this thing of Mid-South was kind of, um, how do I say it? I don't say they were the darling promotion, but everybody pretty much would say that Mid-South Wrestling had the best TV show at the, of the time. And I think Dusty didn't take well to that because Dusty worked very hard on his TV. And, yeah. you know, you know, you know and, and, and it just became one of those things where they got big leagued. There was a rivalry there. And I think that Dusty, you know, it was real bad be- with, 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 when they, when they bought the thing. Cause I remember, and it's funny, I went, I went to Houston, Texas and Eddie Gilbert was booking, um, you know, for Crockett, he was booking the thing. And then Dusty started kind of taking over for Eddie Gilbert in, in, in booking the Mid-South stuff. You know, the old Mid-South. They were going to – originally they were going to keep Mid-South as a separate territory, or, or UWF was what it was called. Where have I heard this before? Yeah. They were going to keep yeah, – yeah, I know. Yeah, the exact same thing. They're going to keep it as a separate territory. Remember, they still had their champions, and so it was the first thing they do, exactly what WWE did. They send um, – was it Brad Armstrong and Tim Horner, right? Over – I know Armstrong, yeah. Yeah, Brad Armstrong and Tim Horner – who were two very good wrestlers who, for whatever reason, Tim Horner was kind of colorless, but very technically good. And Brad Armstrong was technically excellent and um, just missed something in the charisma department to be a superstar because he certainly had the talent to be a superstar. Um, and they were they were a great team. So the first thing they do is they send them over and they have them. But they were like a, um, you know, like in Jim Crockett promotions, they were underneath guys. They send them over to, to UWF and they make them tag team champions. Mm-hmm. Big Bubba Rogers, you know, he was a guy who wasn't doing much at the time in Crockett. He had a nice feud with Dusty and then he had a nice feud with Ronnie Garvin, but he was now down on the cards and wasn't really doing a whole hell of a lot. So he sent them over to, um, um, you know, uh, to, to, to Mid-South or UWF and, and he beats one man gang. So all of a sudden you've got these mid-card Crockett guys as your champions in UWF, which is exactly what you didn't want to do. If anything, you want to do the opposite. You want to have the Crockett guys come in and win the belts. Like, um, you know, I mean, I'm not saying like it didn't exactly work this year for Noah that great, but the, that, that's what I would have done. Is, mm-hmm. is you, you bring guys in um, from the outside, you know, with Noah, like with Minoru Suzuki and, and Davey Boy Smith and Lance Archer, you bring them over and you have them win. And so the local fans, you know, the, the hometown fans, you know, they're, they're, they're over at first. Well, you know, Bill, you know, I mean, um, um, Dusty, I should say, again, their big thing was, was they wanted the syndicated network. They didn't want, they didn't want the talent. Dusty was happy with his talent. Um, so he didn't really do much with the UWF guys. The only one Rick Steiner kind of got over later. Um, and Sting of course became a big star, but like I was saying, so I'm in Houston, Eddie Gilbert has just turned Sting and Eddie Gilbert's just telling me, you know, like. You've got to see it. And Eddie Gilbert saw Stardom and Sting before anybody else, um, you know, no matter what anyone says, because he was the first guy to tell me about it. And 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 um, so anyway, and this is still was when, when Eddie and Sting were a tag team. Then he turned Sting babyface. And he's just like, this guy's going to be, you know, it. So I go down to Houston. And Sting had just turned and Eddie's telling me how over he is. And um, I just remember I'm, so I'm at the show 
And Sting comes out, and it's a pretty damn good reaction for, for a second match guy who just turned babyface, who was never a star. And he's getting he's got this natural charisma. Couldn't avoid it, right? Um, and then he lost to Hangman Rick Harris, or it was Black Bart, I think it was. Oh, God. You know, and, and it's just like, um, you know, it, it was it was just Well, like, if he's really that good, Dave, he'll get over anyway. <laughs> well, he did. <laughs> There you go. See, that's where the, that's how they learn. He did. he did. Ric Flair got him over the next year, but but um, but it was just like that was the example. You know, it's like there, yeah. you know, and then you had like Terry Taylor and you know Terry Taylor was a great great wrestler in that at that point, and he, he could have been he could have fit in with the mix, but Terry Terry Taylor I guess, um, you know he he did the Dixie Carter thing. You know, do you ever hear that story? Um, I think I know where you're going, but it's not occurring to me right away. Okay. Okay, so, so Terry Taylor was in the dressing room, and he was cutting a Dusty Rhodes promo, but making fun of Dusty Rhodes. Oh, yeah. You don't do not, that. And then Dusty hears it. Not knowing that Dusty's listening on the intercom. <laughs> and that's it for him. He's just done. You know, he's, <laughs> I mean, all of a sudden, he's making $300 a week, and he's starving, right? And he's the Red Rooster in no time flat. Yeah, that was about a year, maybe a year or two later. Yeah. He went to he went to Dallas first, where he made no money there, and then he oh, had to go and make money in WWE. But Jimmy but yeah, Barnett, Jimmy Barnett did that too, didn't he? He goes, oh, that was that was a really good imitation. You're fired. Yeah, yeah. Boy. So 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 there was that, and then Eddie, you know, Eddie was really headstrong, Eddie Gilbert, and um, so him and Dusty were button heads because, you know, Eddie thought that we were the redheaded stepchildren, and they were. I mean, I'm. I'm watching it going, God, you know, yeah. it, we were all thinking the same thing that like you're just burying everybody um, because you wanted to prove that, you know, Jim Crockett and Dusty wanted to prove that their guys were better than Watts's guys. Because I think there was that whole thing of, oh, Bill, Bill's guys are, are, are just as good or better or they got better, rest, you know, the best wrestling's Mid-South and UWF. And I think that Dusty wanted to prove that his guys were better. So he beat all those guys and made them worthless and. Yeah, so it was it was um, it, it could have worked out. It was squandered and uh, yeah, squandered yeah. is the word. I mentioned Jim Barnett, um, and I mentioned that that he was kind of a background player in, in the uh, the Vince McMahon Georgia purchase, um, and and I'm trying to ascertain how he lands back. I think it's in '87 that he comes back to work for Jim Crockett Promotions and leaves the WWF. I've heard different accounts. Basically, Vince Vince, Vince, Vince fired him. Vince was paranoid that he was talking to the to the enemy, right? Behind the scenes, keeping an open channel of communication with people he considered on the other side of, of the that world. Could be, that could be – you know, I never heard the story on why Vince fired him. I, I got the impression that it was some sort of a double-cross thing. But, you know, like, you know, Vince never – you know, I never spoke to Vince about the subject. Yeah. And I, I did speak to Barnett, and, and Barnett – um. You know, you're not going to get the true story on why Vince fired him from Barnett, and Barnett never really addressed it, other than you know he tried to commit suicide as soon as he got fired. Yeah, he overdosed. Yeah, he tried to commit suicide. My feeling was is it was one of those try to commit suicide, but someone catches you for sympathy. I, I don't think he really was trying to commit suicide. I'm actually pretty strong on that. I don't remember if he actually told me that. I mean, I certainly believed that at the time. Yeah. And and and, and just knowing Jim, and I like Jim a lot, but I. Absolutely. Um, well, for someone who's so broken up about it, he goes right back to work for Crockett there. Yeah. Well, Jim did. You know. You. You know. Like what you said makes sense. Like I said, I never really got a straight story, but but Jim absolutely was a guy who stayed on good terms with everybody. Right. And and, and yes. Yeah, so that was, was in the uh, the Sean the Sean Asale book in the Mike Moonham book that it was him talking to I believe Crockett or somebody that Vince considered the enemy, keeping that 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 would that would have been it, and he would have and he would have done that, and and I can believe. Yeah, you know that 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 makes sense to me perfectly because when Barnett got fired, I I will say this, I was shocked. Yeah, because you know, he, was, he was you know what the number two or three guy in the company. Yeah, and and he was the guy doing all the you know we knew Barnett was doing all the dirty work, and um you know probably knew where the bodies were buried. And, yep. And then all of a sudden one day he's fired, and then you know I hear he's fired one day, and the next day I hear he's you know he tries to kill himself. Mm. And, so what and, role does he assume when he goes back to Crockett in 87? What, what I role don't remember he... how big, you know, I don't remember him being that big. Of yeah. A deal. Um, all the way know, through WCW, he kind of, from this point forward becomes kind of a background player in a lot of ways. He's not in the foreground like he had been. Yeah. I mean, he was on the booking committee with, 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 um, with WCW a couple of years later, mm -hmm. but I don't, I don't remember, um, you know, exactly, um, anything significant that he did. I mean, he may have been, you know, hired because he knew he knew 
you know, he knew everybody in the TV industry. Or, oh, yeah. Or, um, I mean, from, from the 50s, like, he knew, like, if he knew if the people from the 50s were still around, he knew them. And if he didn't, you know, the way the TV industry was, he, like, the TV industry was a lot of sons of, of, of people from the 50s. Oh, sure. Stations, you know, that, that their fathers had run. So he knew everyone's father, and, and so he could get in with the and, and he was just so charming that, you know, he was everybody's buddy. We're right around this time, another one of our favorites, and only Anderson leaves. He gets kicked out of the horseman, and he's gone from the picture after being, you know, part of the original horseman stable and, and involved in Georgia and getting involved in, in the merged kind of product after they buy Georgia. Uh, why did Ole part ways with, with Crockett Promotions around this point in time? I don't remember exactly, but because um, he came back later. Yeah, that's true. Uh, he did the big return with Arn. Yeah, yeah. When he when his last big run with him and Arn as a tag team. Um, well, then, were you surprised? Uh, just to move on to another subject here in '87. Were you surprised that they came back with the scaffold match? Here we have the Rock and Rolls versus the Midnight Express in the Skywalkers match. A year after, uh, it sounded like you know it was really hot and and really dramatic. Well, that's, they did it. It worked so well that yeah. they did it again. But but it didn't work. This you know the second time, it's like. Um, it, in in a sense, they they try to capture the magic, and it wasn't there the second time. And I I'm, I think that they, as I recall, they did a pretty decent scaffold match, but it was like nothing. You know what I mean? Like if they had done a regular rock and roll midnight match, it would have been you know much better because those guys those guys just had a, a, an incredible chemistry together. 